Good morning, and welcome to this service of worship from the Sanctuary of St. James Presbyterian Church in Stouffville, Ontario. Thank you for joining with us. It's always good to worship together. And we'll begin by lighting our Christ candle. Today, <clears throat> we cannot help but think of the anger, frustration, and discomfort that are being experienced at strategic locations in our country caused by those who refuse to participate in ensuring public health by receiving vaccinations. Our several levels of government have indicated that it is time to finish the demonstrations and for truckers and other participants to go home. How these confrontations will be resolved is not yet known, but we pray that peace will prevail. We pray for the peace of Christ, that violence will be precluded, and that a way will be found to work with people on both sides who will never change their minds. Loving, we will pray to God for peace. Kelly G will join with me as we lead uh, us together in a responsive call to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song. Let us make melody before our God. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Let us praise God's holy name together. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For God is gracious and steadfast in mercy. A song of praise is always fitting. For God heals the brokenhearted and binds up our wounds. And our first hymn this morning is number 712, Arise, Your Light is Come. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God of majesty and mystery, we come before you in wonder and in humility. Source of all that is, you are beyond our imagining, astonishing us with the detail and designs within your creation. Word of hope and healing, you touch our lives with truth and tenderness revealing our need and our gift. Spirit of purpose and possibility, you move within us when we least expect it, awakening our gifts, urging us to respond. Receive our praise and prayer this day and prepare us to receive your word in its wisdom and warning. 
For we come to you through Christ our Lord, trusting in his grace and truth. God of life and love, at this season of the year, our hearts are grateful for all the love which touches our lives. Still, we confess that we are not always shining examples of the love we long for. Forgive, forgive us those times when we fail to keep our word and disappoint those who love us. Forgive us when we gave in to our tempers and temptations and disappointed your hopes for us. Renew and remake us through the grace of your Son, Jesus, your love made flesh. Amen. The Gospel of John reveals that God is love and that God's perfect love casts out fear. We are promised that those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. So claim your hope in this good news. God's perfect love abides in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. The anthem this morning is Lift Up the Lord. Thank you, Kelly. That was lovely. And thank you, Craig. <laughs> Let us pray. God, you are the source of wisdom and understanding for us. Amid all that distracts us, help us listen in stillness. During competing voices, may we hear your word for our lives and our times. By your spirit, Help us discern Jesus' call to follow him. Amen. <clears throat> Blessings is a familiar and frequently used salutation and closing to an email or a letter sent very often by people of faith, including ministers. I use it myself and know that many of my colleagues do the same. It is a simple expression of a wish or a hope that God will bless the recipient of the email or the letter. No specific kind of blessing is requested of God, just an all-purpose generic blessing. God's richest blessings, we say. That makes me wonder if some of God's blessings maybe are not so rich, or if a generic request for blessings has any value at all, or if the phrase has become grossly overused and vacuous. To say that we are blessed and to express gratitude for God's blessings may also require some rethinking. Too often I must confess 
that I thank God for blessings I have received, including during this time of COVID, a roof over my head, food on the dinner table, a job, family and friends who have all remained COVID free. Then I wonder about all those folks who don't have a roof over their head or food and the table to put it on or who are homeless or jobless or friendless and alone. Are they therefore not able to thank God for blessings? And why has God blessed me and not them? We use our language so superficially sometimes. Perhaps God would have us stop expressing gratitude and start having more honest conversations with those who appear to not have been blessed by God. It all reminds me of another phrase with which I am very uncomfortable. There but for the grace of God go I. In other words, God's grace has been bestowed upon me and not upon someone else very similar to me who has suffered some catastrophe. Me, me, me. It's all about me. The prosperity goal, gospel, the prosperity gospel is a religious belief among some Protestant Christians that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for them and that faith, positive speech, and donations to their church will increase one's material wealth. Surely the arrogance of such a perspective should be visible to all, as well as the fact that it is totally contrary to the teachings of Jesus who always exercised a preferential option for the poor or others who have suffered on the margins of society in some way. Who gets to be blessed and who does the blessing? Who doesn't get blessed and why? Is it all just another way of talking about us versus them? If you are not blessed, are you cursed? Who does the cursing? Blessings and cursings are talked about in both the Old and the New Testaments. In today's Old Testament text, Jeremiah expresses God's pro proclamation of who is cursed and who is blessed. The text is Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 10. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an unhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, who tr whose trust is the Lord, they shall be like a tree planted by the water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Who do you trust? As that old TV game show used to ask, who do you trust? Aside from the bad grammar, it should have been entitled, whom do you trust? The show was a success for several years back in the late 50s and early 60s. Married pairs of contestants were asked to answer questions with the husband deciding whether he or she would answer. In fact, the show was originally entitled, Do You Trust Your Wife? But that was soon changed. So today, in the 21st century, and amid a global pandemic, the rise of the ultra-conservative right, and a lot of anger right around the world, how do we decide which voices 
are trustworthy. Traditional authority figures including governments, the church, the police, teachers and doctors no longer carry the trust of the people the way they used to because their biases and instincts toward maintaining the status quo, including maintaining their authority at any cost, have been made public. Those institutions are now viewed with much more skepticism, and perhaps rightly so. The values on which their decisions and choices are made much more exposed now, and we, the public, must decide which of those values we uphold. Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, says the Lord through Jeremiah. I'm not sure if I feel cursed when some individual or some institution that I believed in turns out to be faulty, guilty of being self-serving in some way, as much as I feel perhaps betrayed. To have your trust proven ill-placed is hurtful. I trusted you, and you let me down. Maybe you felt that way as we learned together more details of our own past as Canadians and the values that our predecessors held and how hurtful and wrong their decisions were with our First Nations people. On a personal note, I was greatly dismayed when I learned of the shameful behavior toward some women and vulnerable people by my hero, Jean Vanier. How can such a wise and thoughtful and God-filled man fall so low? It is a reminder that as human beings, we are all broken in greater or lesser ways. Yet Jesus teaches us that bad behavior is to be called out, made public, and no longer tolerated. Perhaps it is in sorrow or guilt or regret that we turn back toward God and try again to figure out who God would have us be and how that will change our attitudes and behavior toward other people and our formerly beloved institutions. It takes personal desire to be a better human being, to analyze our own values buried deep and rarely examined. It takes courage, willpower, and humility to pray honestly and ask for whatever it is we need from God to change our ways. In Jeremiah, God says that this is the way to a better life, to a salvation of sorts. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. The imagery of the tree is still useful today perhaps increasingly so, because we know now, from a scientific perspective, the amazing capacity of trees to grow, to thrive among a community of trees, and to nurture and communicate with each other. If you haven't read The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wollenbin, I encourage you to do so. The heart is a devious, is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I am reminded of Paul's complaint when he says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We start out with good intentions, but get sidetracked by temptations. And often we give in to those self-serving temptations as individuals, as congregations, as a culture, and as a nation. I get why the life of faith is a long process. It is a journey. And I'm not sure we ever get to our destination, at least this side of the grave. I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart. And that's probably a very good thing. God never gives up on us. God uses the opportunities of our lives as they arise to bring to our attention values and actions that we should, perhaps, reevaluate. God wants us to be intentional about how we live our lives, to drive and not drift 
in our spiritual journey. God gives us what we need to continue that journey and to grow in our faith. It remains up to us to accept God's gifts, including the terrible moments of life as well as the gratifying ones. Make changes and grow from all experiences. God loves us and that is never to be doubted. What is the opposite of love? The opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. Let us not be guilty of turning away because we just don't care enough. That applies to every aspect of our lives as a people who are part of the body of Christ. Jesus spoke of blessings and curses or woes, and they are recorded in two places in the New Testament. In Matthew, the Beatitudes are part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he is addressing a huge crowd of people. In Luke, still surrounded by the crowds, Jesus has a quiet moment and a quiet conversation with only his disciples. His Sermon on the Plain is directed towards those who have chosen to become his disciples, and it contains wisdom for us as well as 21st century disciples. The Gospel text is from Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. If we rearrange Jesus' words a little, we realize the blessings and woes are complementary and maybe describe a typical life of discipleship. Blessed are you who are poor. Woe to you who are rich. Blessed are you who are hungry. Woe to you who are full. Blessed are you who weep. Woe to you who are laughing. Blessed are you when people hate you. Woe to you when all speak well of you. For those of us who live comfortably, those words may seem very challenging. It is difficult to underrate the benefits we have received because we live in Canada, are among the healthiest and wealthiest of the countries in the world, are part of the dominant culture, and have managed, for whatever reason, to be able to afford a very comfortable lifestyle. How do we reconcile Jesus' words with our current circumstances? Unlike Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, Luke's account takes place on the plain, on the flatlands. There is no peak from which to see far into the distance or down upon the people. When you're on the level, you're looking at each other in the face and in the eye. Jesus' words were to his disciples and thus to the church and are not directed at the larger crowd. He's talking to them about discipleship, 
about being intentional of following in his footsteps all the way. At this point in Jesus' ministry, the disciples may not know that Jesus' journey will take him to the cross and that their call to discipleship will include cross-like sacrifices. Perhaps it is a good thing that we cannot see too far into the future. Every life has its peaks and its valleys, its high-as-the-sky experiences, and its times of challenge and despair and feelings of hopelessness. How do we journey through those times and remain faithful to our acceptance of the title of disciple of Jesus? The path of redemption and wholeness, of blessing, is a complex journey. We cannot focus on just one place or one time or one way of being that resonates and makes sense. A cross-shaped life demands living in the tension of honest confession of our failures before God and the acceptance of God's grace. Jesus' words put a great deal of emphasis on the poor, acknowledging the power that wealth exerts that isolates us from God and from the rest of the human community. Poverty in Jesus' day, as well as today, is often accompanied by a feeling of shame and emotional suffering. Wealth and well-being delude us into thinking that we are responsible for our status and considered honorable among our like-minded friends. It encourages us to think that we have the power and the ability and maybe even the right to be well off. We've worked hard, so maybe we deserve it. How easy it is to get gently tempted to let go of our relationship with God and the humility that it brings. So easy to let go and give ourselves a pat on the back, to share a little out of our excess with those who have less, and thus feel good about our so-called generosity. In our economic prosperity, perhaps we we should be saying, woe is me, because we know the temptations that surround us. Can we be rich disciples of Jesus? Is it possible to retain the humility and sense of dependence on God that true discipleship calls for and be well off? Perhaps that is why Luke suggests that it is the poor who are blessed because they are not tempted in the same way to remain strongly connected to God through prayer, through praise, and through the practice of life. They do not need to ask the question, how much is too much, or how much is more than enough of themselves? Perhaps that's a question for the rest of us. Discipleship challenges us, the privileged, to a simplicity of living that would push back against unbridled materialism and consumerism that our society promotes. And there are opportunities for us to participate with others in this movement. There are, for example, those who are in favor of increasing accessibility to more affordable housing in major urban centers by changing the local zoning laws. Those who stand opposed to such initiatives are NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Others who are more supportive of this social justice movement label themselves YIMBYs, yes, in my backyard. The end goal is to support a wider social well-being of those with fewer resources, fewer opportunities, and increased vulnerability. As the barriers that separate the poor and the rich are breached, broken down and eroded, a more inclusive community is is created. It is not us or them. It is all of us together. So where's the good news? It is all good news. When we have felt that something is missing in our lives, something that we long for, when we have gone through periods of loneliness and despair, it is God who carries us through those tough times. Remember the poem, Footsteps in the Sand. 
at those times when we felt most alone, that is when God carries us, whether we realize it or not. And when life is good, when we can celebrate our health and our wealth and our prosperity, we know that God has equipped us to care and to share and to be God's feet and hands for those who are struggling. We can participate in the bringing about of God's kingdom of goodness, kindness, and well-being for all people. In times of blessing and in times of woes, we belong together, serving each other's and all others' needs. It is divinely blessed reciprocity, binding us together as children of God and disciples of Jesus. Thanks be to God for the wisdom to place our faith in God in all circumstances. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, teacher of wisdom, courage, and love, we bear fruit when we overflow with your spirit, that spirit of generosity, that spirit of pouring ourselves out in service, that spirit of bearing another's burden. Give us your spirit this and every day. May we continue to move in the direction of discipleship that Jesus taught. Amen. The hymn is number 722, and we'll sing the verse, first three verses of Lord Whose Love. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God of mystery and mercy, we come before you today carrying hopes and dreams, the burdens and blessings of our lives. We bring all that is on our hearts and minds to you, seeking your comfort and strength, listening for your guidance, grateful that you hear us when we pray. We give you thanks that you engage with us whenever we need you, especially when we feel challenged and uncertain. We know that in many ways we are so blessed 
and we are so grateful and humbled. We seek to be worthy of your blessings. Loving God, we give thanks for the gift of life, for family and friends whom we love and who love us. We are grateful for opportunities to laugh, to share our joy, to celebrate everything that is good in this world. Yet we also pray for all who are fearful about their future, those who wrestle with challenges at work or at home. Help us face our fears, sure of your steadfast love. We pray today for all those who are facing health concerns and for those who care for them. Surround each one with your steadfast love. God of peace and promise, we know that your spirit prays within us when we cannot find the words. Today we pray for those whose burdens seem too heavy to bear, for the victims of violence or disaster, for refugees at risk in so many places in the world, and those making a new home in our community. We pray for those caught in despair and poverty, in our own neighborhoods, and in the forgotten corners of the world. Renew the strength of all who are facing realities beyond their control with your steadfast love. God, sometimes we don't know what to pray. We just know that we have a lot on our minds and we feel stretched, not ourselves, and we need you. We need your wisdom, your guidance, and your comfort. Hear the prayers of our hearts, God, spoken and unspoken. God in community, holy in one, may our hearts beat as one with your heart, even as we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our faith does not rely, fortunately, on human wisdom, but on the power of God working in and among us. And so we bring our offering, trusting that each gift has a power beyond itself, the power that God gives. Trust in the miracle of God at work in the world through the gifts that we bring.
Let us pray. God, you are the source of our lives. From you, all loving kindness, justice, and mercy flow. Bless these gifts so that acts of kindness, justice, and mercy may flow through them too. And bless our lives so our words and actions show your spirit at work in us and through us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our friend and Savior. Amen. And our concluding hymn is number 730, and we'll sing the first three verses of O oh, for a World Where Everyone. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and to redeem, so God sends you into the world this day to be light and love and healing and hope, to be a blessing to those around you. Go now to be light to the world. May the grace and peace of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, come upon you this day and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.
Marker, February 13th.